Hi everyone, my name is Lily Danzis and I'm the Administrative Assistant for the Great Smokies Writing Program and welcome to the final session of Writers at Home for 2021. Um, thank you all for joining us today as we celebrate the fall issue of our program publication, The Great Smokies Review. It's always a great way to wrap up the semester by hearing some of the amazing work generated uh, in our classes. And as always, we're incredibly grateful to Malaprops for giving us this virtual space. Today's reading wraps over fall semester, um, so now is a great time to start thinking ahead to the spring. Our spring 2022 class descriptions are posted on our website. Here's a quick rundown of the ones that are still open. Uh, for our five-week classes starting in March and April, we have a No Frills Poetry Workshop with Luke Hankins, aimed at helping participants see their poems more objectively and improving the mechanics of the writing. Putting it all together, a toolkit for novel building with Jody Lynn Anderson, for those who wish to find more solid footing in writing, structuring, and completing novels. The fantastic ekphrastic writing workshop with Ali Marshall focused on discussing and creating ekphrastic work, which is art made in response to another piece of artwork. And Memoir Builder with Tessa Fontaine, a generative course for writers interested in translating personal experience and research into effective memoir. Our 10-week classes start in mid-February. Uh, we have Prose and Photos coming at Writing Sidewise with Vicki Lane. Uh, which focuses on using photos as prompts and inspiration for your prose, a writer's toolkit, building your skills and strengths in essay writing and editing with Amy Jesse, guiding writers of personal essays and profiles, through the tools and skills to elevate their writing, finding the true voice within you with Bruce Spang, exploring and drawing inspiration from the works of 20th century and contemporary queer poets, and setting the scene where fiction and memoir come together with Sebastian Matthews, experimenting with fiction uh, and memoir and memoir and fiction. Uh, and lastly, our last available 15 week class um, starting February 2nd is from pen to polished short fiction workshop with Annie Fraser Crandall and will guide students through the process of taking their early short story or flash fiction drafts all the way through development, revision and publication prep. Registration for all our classes is open and you can find instructions as well as full course descriptions on our website, which is greatsmokies.unca.edu. So let's get started. It's now my pleasure to introduce Elizabeth Lutchens, Editor-in-Chief of the Great Smokies Review. Elizabeth is also the instructor for our prose master class, which she's led for 15 years and will continue to lead in the spring. I've said it before, but we're incredibly lucky to have Elizabeth with the program and the review and here to introduce our readers today. Elizabeth, I'll pass the mic to you. Thanks, Lily. Um, I just want to echo Lily a little bit to say that we really do deep, deeply appreciate the role Malaprops has played for many years in the Great Smokies writing program and the literary publication we're involved with, the Great Smokies Review. I speak for myself and the rest of the editorial team, Julie Abbott, Janet Moore, and our UNC Asheville intern, Eliana Franklin. Although we miss the downtown Asheville in-person readings, we are grateful to Malaprops for hosting these virtual events. And thank you all for tuning in. Reading today are representatives of writers who work, whose work appears in the fall issue of the Great Smokies Review. And of course, these are just a few. Um, they're, they're all wonderful and we hope that you will go and check them out. It's uh, thegreatsmokiesreview.org. This is our 25th issue. So the readers are Eliana Franklin, who was a senior creative writing major and environmental studies minor at UNC Asheville. She is also our um, intern for, for the Great Smokies Review this year. And she's done a wonderful job of editing and, and uh, responding. And we're just very lucky, lucky to have had her. She's previously been published in the online journals Lucky Jefferson and Applause, as well as UNC Asheville's literary magazine, Headwaters. She often finds inspiration in the environment outside her window. Whoops, Not too quickly. Anshu Gupta is a writer in Charlotte, North Carolina, where she lives with her husband and two children. She serves on the board of the Charlotte Writers Club. She has not yet found a cure for her book buying addiction and will soon be buried alive by the stacks of books accumulating on her bedside table. Anya Robiak works in early childhood education and has lived in Asheville for 15 years. This story was an experiment with a first person plural narration, which seemed to her to lend itself to writing about a time of life unknown for its collective consciousness. 
I'm sorry, known, <laughs> sorry, Anya, known for its collective consciousness. Whitney Waters, also of Asheville, is a poet and lover of the outdoors. She teaches English composition at Western Carolina University, where she earned her MA in English literature in May, 2020. She's currently an MFA candidate at Warren Wilson College. Rachel Stein is the first author to be selected for our new Writing Redux feature. She has revised a short story that first appeared in the fall 2015 Great Smokies Review and is part of a collection of linked stories that she's completing. Her fiction has been published in Minerva Rising and Word Peace. One story was a semifinalist for the Doris Betts Story Competition. And she has read memoir essays on NPR's 51%. Janet Moore, our special features editor, will read for Rachel, who sadly is unable to be here today. We'll begin with Eliana reading a piece of creative nonfiction. Eliana? So this piece is called Lost Words. On a sunny Sunday in March, my roommate and I set foot in graveyard fields off the Blue Ridge Parkway. As usual, I sought inspiration from the world around me. I'd spent time staring at blank pages recently, but I thought a breath of fresh air in the mountains would reawaken the dormant poems inside my mind. We began our hike out in the bright sunlight, high up on the ridge where only rock, sand, and scraggly bushes lived. Our feet trampled through trenches dug in the ground and we climbed, reaching for that upper height, that sight of a pale blue peak. Soon we entered the shadows of the gray curvy tree trunks and rhododendron. My roommate told me it looked like a haunted forest in Transylvania. I had to disagree. It didn't feel scary to me. Even though I grew up in the city, I always found ways to feel close to nature. Never afraid, I worried more about the human impact on the planet than any perils posed by the environment. Home alone on a Saturday in seventh grade, I went out in my backyard just after it had rained. I took off my shoes and jumped around in puddles and felt the wet grass between my toes. Then I pulled out my science composition book and wrote a poem. I wanted that feeling again, for inspiration to roll right out of the earth and into my mind, for the leaves to blow words into my head with the breeze, for whispers of wind to transform into lines, stanzas, ripples of letters on a page, but today I couldn't think of anything that felt original. My roommate and I stopped in a, a grassy clearing for a break before traveling along another trail. After only 20 minutes, however, the entire path turned to water. Reflections of the white clouds above danced in the curving stream. We turned around following the signs back to the woods. My shoes squished along the rocky trail, my feet hopping between stones that flickered under golden sunbeams. At the fork in the path, we went left. Mud sloshed around, splashing dirt up onto my ankles and legs. Slim branches jetted out above us, a constellation of infinite crisscrosses. The air grew chillier. I slipped on my sweatshirt. We've been walking for too long, I said. I think we went the wrong way. My feet felt clammy and my heart began to hammer. We didn't know where we were. Just keep going, said my roommate. The sun sank lower in the sky. My phone's battery dropped to 40%. Everything looked the same. I stopped noticing the way my feet felt when they hit the ground. I stopped noticing the way the wind sounded. I stopped noticing the water seeping into my shoes. I stopped noticing the smell of soil, the smell of cool mountain air, the smell of soft mosses and lichens. The world rushed by around me. I despise the earth and its twisting turns and the danger of its coming night. This is not what I wanted, I thought. This is not what I intended to write about. I had planned on beautiful descriptions of shimmering waters and the scent of blooming spring flowers, not shadowy woods or icy winds. Eventually, we arrived back in the same clearing we'd been in an hour before. We realized our mistake. We'd turned left instead of right. We'd gone in a giant circle, and now we had to walk the entire loop again. We made it back to the parking lot just as the sun descended. The horizon turned pink and purple and orange, lighting up the mountain silhouettes. The stars appeared beside a pale crescent moon. The path had brought us to see a sacred ritual the planet undergoes every evening at the peak of wind and sound. In the red incandescence of the lowering sun, I had my idea. In the moment my toes felt cold and wet from soaked feet, when my hands turned ghostly from the decreasing air temperatures, the words arrived. 
Poetry comes with the unexpected. Poetry is the surprise in the last line, the way your eyes stroll through a forest of alphabetical arrangements, wondering what's going to happen next. I couldn't plan the poem ahead of time. I had to let the lines flow toward me like the path that turned to water. In graveyard fields, I didn't find the words until I got lost. Elizabeth, you're muted. Thank you, Eliana. We wanted more. <laughs> I should have told you to read another poem, but another time. Uh, next, we'll hear from fiction writer Anshu Gupta. Hi, this is a short story titled Long Division. Every morning, Anju rose early to make two parantas for Maya, triangle ones the way she liked, folded them in half and wrapped them in aluminum foil. She put these into the Barbie lunchbox, along with a small Tupperware container of subji and a foil wrap packet of mango achar. And then she added orange slices that she had offered as prashad in her morning prayers so that Maya would have God's blessings with her. Every day, Maya took the Barbie lunchbox to school, swinging it in her hand and brought it back empty in the afternoon. When Maya came home that day, Anju was silent and didn't give her the usual welcome kiss at the door. She shrugged off her coat, dropped her backpack on the chair in the dining room. Guess what, mom? I got a 94 on the math test. It was the highest grade in the class. She came into the kitchen while Anju turned on the heat under the kahai to make her after school snack. She tested the oil to see if it was hot enough and then slipped in the first booty. The oil sizzled and bubbled around the edges as it inflated into a round balloon. She turned it over to let the other side brown for a few seconds before scooping it out onto the paper towel line platter. Maya continued chattering excitedly about her test while her mother worked. Why didn't you get 100? Anju finally asked. Your father has told you many times that maths are the only subject where you can get 100%. You did not study hard enough. You'll study more for the next test. She fried two more booties and added them to the platter. Maya watched in silence, the broad smile she had on her face gone. Anju put the booties along with some alu pujia onto a plate and set it in front of Maya. Nina auntie says you owe Tina $25. What have you been doing? Why does my eight-year-old daughter need $25? Why? When Maya didn't answer, she continued, her voice rising. She says, Tina told her you throw your lunch in the garbage every day and then borrow money from her to buy cafeteria food. You lie to me and to God every day. What did I do to deserve such a daughter? Mom, it's weird food. It looks and it smells funny. The kids make fun of me. What weird? You love parantas and subji. Anju was outraged. Yeah, but not in school. I can't eat it in front of everyone else. They laugh and they call me curry head. Then why you do not tell me this, Maya? Why must it, I hear it from Nina that you're borrowing money? If you want to buy lunch, you ask me, why must you lie? I asked you, mom. You said, no, you said we can't afford it. Yes, Pitta, we cannot afford to waste $2 every day for you to buy lunch in school when you can take perfectly good food from home. Your father works so hard to provide for us and we must spend carefully. But better I give you money for, than for you to put shame on your family with such deceit and dishonesty. Jay doesn't think weird food. I don't hear about Jay doing this hateful thing. Jay, Jay is a nerd. Everyone calls him an Indian geek. He doesn't have any friends except for Rajiv and Akash, also geeks. They sit all alone at a table. No one else talks to them. I don't want to be like Jay. So you want to be one of the American? Your brother and your friends are Indian geeks. You, your mother and father are Indian geek. Your family is Indian geek. Then you are Indian geek too, Maya Beta. Remember that. You will never be like the Guras because the color of your skin is different. You can throw all your lunches away, but they will never accept you. They'll call everything about you weird and funny. Tina buys school lunch. Nina, auntie lets her. 
That's because Tina, Nina Auntie is too lazy to get up in the morning and to cook. She doesn't even make roti for dinner, just heats up pizza bread from the store. Be grateful you have a mother who loves you enough to get up early and cook good, healthy food for you. So don't get up early. I didn't ask you to do it. I don't want it. I'm not going to eat Indian food in school. I'm not. You can keep giving it to me and I'll keep throwing it away. And if you don't give me the lunch money, I just won't eat lunch, Maya shouted. She pushed the chair back and ran to her room, slamming the door shut. Anju followed, railing at the closed door. What did I do that God gave me this ungrateful daughter? She has no respect for her family, for the sacrifices her mother and father make for her. She doesn't care that she disgraces her parents, her family name with lies. She cuts off my nose so I can't show my face to our friends and neighbors. Maya lay sobbing on her bed until her mother finally stopped shrieking through the door. Her mother would never understand. Her mother walking all around town in her saris, never noticing how people stared at them. She only came out in the evening when she couldn't hold off going to the bathroom anymore. Papa was home and her mother was setting dinner on the table. Your American daughter has come out of the room, her mother said coldly. Papa sighed and put down the newspaper, motioned Maya to come sit next to him on the sofa. What am I hearing? It's wrong to lie, Maya. I know it's hard for you to be different, and it's difficult to be the target of others' laughters and jokes, but there's not much we can do about it. If you want to buy lunch in school, then your mother will give you the money. But please, Bitta, do not lie. It's dishonorable, and it will only hurt you. I'm sorry, Papa. Mama, Maya was ashamed. She hung her head, gazing down at the floor. Papa was gentle and soft-spoken, unlike her mother. He worked long hours and tried his best to set an example for them. She loved him so much. She didn't want to hurt him. The next morning, her mother refused to look at her. Jay's lunchbox was on the breakfast table, but hers was missing. Instead, next to her plate was a small pile of money. That was the day her life split into two. Always wanting to belong, she continued to live a double life. One person at home with her family and a different one outside of it. Before, she had never given a second thought to deceiving her parents. She was just doing what had to be done to fit in with the American kids, the way she brushed her teeth or her hair. But after the confrontation with her mother, her lunchbox sat, never used again, on a bookshelf in the corner of her room. The blonde Barbie's wide open blue eyes, a constant witness to her guilt and shame. The end. Try to remember to unmute myself. I'm so sorry. Thanks so much, um, Anshu. And our next reader is Carrie Fry, who's reading her poem that appears in the fall issue with a couple of additions. Thank you so much, Elizabeth. And thank you everyone for being here. These are two poems I wrote while taking a poetry class this past spring with Eric Nelson. And uh, the first one is the one that appeared in the review. It's called Chicken and Stars. Back in her 20s, my friend Sherry was a paralegal in Salt Lake City. She and her boyfriend decided to take up a new life in San Francisco. And the plan was that she'd leave the law firm at lunch without a word to anyone. There he'd be at the curb with all they had in the world packed in the car. There should be moving towards him, shedding her office garb on the way to becoming a desert street creature. The drive with the windows rolled down and the radios on, radio on, bank robbers who had stolen their own future. The clock turned 1150, then noon. Sherry headed for the door and a coworker asked, can you pick me up a can of chicken and star soup? The woman held out a $10 bill. Sherry demurred. From behind her IBM Selectric, the woman insisted with the gentle reproach of someone who isn't even going to take a lunch. Can't you simply get her a can of soup while you're out? 
her $10 burned in Sherry's purse through the desert, like an igneous rock glowing. I think of this story often in my cubicle at an office downtown where every day I hear my coworkers eat their lunches as they hear me eat mine. Tuna fort from a plastic container, the crunch of carrot sticks and chips, the chomping of a microwave block of last night's dinner, the slurp of soda, water, and bad coffee. At night, I cross the parking lot and see the sky throttled with the purple that follows sunset. It's a turbulence I want to answer in some astonishing way and fear I never will. The second poem is uh, one I also wrote for Eric's class and he gave us an assignment to write a poem about an everyday object around our house and he, as inspiration, he shared with us a poem by Dorian Lux called My Mother's Colander, which is a beautiful poem. And in the poem, this homely object becomes transmuted into something beautiful and significant. And I spent a couple of days wandering around my house, looking at everything in the kitchen, wondering, looking at the coffee maker, like, are you a poem? I don't know. And what I ended up writing about was a candle that I like, um, that I keep in my windowsill. It's a candle by a company called Diptyque. They are, if you're not familiar with them, very overpriced candles. And they have um, sort of a very distinctive label. And they each come in a glass jar-like container. And so this is called Meditation on a Diptyque Candle. Chanel lives alone in an apartment across the street from the Ritz, Capote wrote in 1963. The woman of his portrait is old, nothing left but bones, panache, the distilled scent of a flinty eroticism. Of her figure, Coco says, cut off my head and I'm 13. Is this what I purchase when I pay $60 for a candle with a white label, a jumble of Roman letters and hyper serif and a 34 Boulevard Saint-Germain address? The chance to be a column immaculate as bone, to thread through the air as smoke and perfume, sanctified by proximity to the Ritz? Cut off my head and I'm still fat, but my candle, oh my candle, my friends, it's still slim as a girl. Capote observes that Chanel had her first lover when not much past 13. The man offered pearls. She countered for the stakings to start a little shop. Neither she nor Capote seem troubled by the anecdote. It's moral, wise child. Seize the means of production and buy your own pearls. Chanel's father was a blacksmith. She grew up around a stultifying blaze, the clang of iron and male conversation, their perpetual slink and insinuations of smoke, steeped in the knowledge of when to strike, when to bargain, and how to slip what is tender in a shoe that can break bone. When we were 13, our French teacher, Madame Simbalo, wrote to us Sophie, Serge, Dominique, Grégoire, Mimi, the news said an older girl from our town had died on a class trip to Paris. She'd fallen down a long accordion of stairs near the Eiffel Tower. None of us knew her. We sat and considered, cool and collected, even as Madame's lip quivered. What I recall in the air was a dawning sense of the basic incompatibility of being from Wisconsin and ever really making it in Paris. My friend Becky's hand wavered, raised like a stalk. Como dit-on de splat? Poor Madame. Still, I love the candles, sleek lozenges of wax, shiny and smooth as tic tacs, curlicuing of fragrance of ivory flowers, spied in a private garden of a fancy arrondissement, old men playing wool, dusty ground, iron gates. Each candle, isolate and discreet onto itself, each burning to nothing in its own glass coffin, Snow White lives alone across the street from the Ritz. Cut off my head and I'm just liquid and black wick, 
what calm, what umbrageous armfuls of memory to gather up when one has grown worn as a stick, never mind if they're pressed in a factory. I buy them, I burn them, I line them in a window, proof that I too know how to pay too much. Thank you. Thank you. There, muted. Um, now, can you hear me? Am I unmuted now? I'm getting a sort of a funny message on my screen. Um, so next we will hear from Anya Robiak reading a short story excerpt. This is uh, the first five pages of a short story called Montana in the Wild. Adults often said, stop me if I told you this before. They did not ever mean it. If they told you once, it was because they wanted you to be ready when they told you again. Like the way love can seem nothing more than preparation, a hardening of the gifts and maladies you'll carry with you to the next love and the next. This we've come to know. Whatever grabs you first is the story you'll be telling yourself forever. The year we were 12, love was as thick in the air as pollen after a hard spring rain. It didn't have to attach to anyone in particular or any two people. It just hovered and some of us breathed in and sneezed it right back out, a little agitated, a little dreamy, while others stood under the crowded pink trees, eyes closed and drowned in gold. Montana was one who swarmed at love. Out of all of us in our class at Pembroke School for Girls, she was the oldest in some ways, the ways that matter to girls, and if not quite beautiful, she was in the same quadrant of the color wheel. That Montana, our mothers would say to each other while we eavesdropped at carpool and sleepovers, she is something. We'd wait to hear more. What did they think she was exactly? And how did it make her different than the rest of us? But the other mothers would nod, maybe do something significant with their eyebrows, and that was it. We had our own ideas about Montana's kind of something. Back in the fourth grade at a roller rink birthday party, Montana skated up to the group of us, color hectic, dark hair wild. You see that guy over there, she asked, gesturing broadly at the rink. He skated up behind me and grabbed me right up off the ground. I couldn't move or anything till he set me back down. We all looked at the rink with new intensity. Who, that old guy, that guy in the black t-shirt? Yeah, that one, Montana said, breathing hard. Out of her school uniform, her clothes tended to sparkle and jangle. She adorned with big eyed animals and tight glittery jeans. Her Smarties candy necklace had begun to melt against her sweaty neck, leaving pale sugary streaks. It was as though right in front of us, someone was painting her into something different. I was so scared. The two Ellas grabbed each other's hands. I don't wanna go back out there. Don't worry, Montana said, switching gears. He probably just did it the once. But a few minutes later, Lacey came tearing over. He grabbed me too, she said. She was a good sized girl already edging towards breasts that might have just been fat or might have been real breasts. We were never sure. He picked you up, we asked doubtfully, like off your feet. Montana linked her arm through Lacey's. He's super strong, Montana said. At this point, most of us became aware of wanting our moms. What we wouldn't give for the gray musty haven of a minivan, our brothers kicking our shins, the babies wailing from their car seats. But we had to seem tougher than that. After all, Montana and Lacey were fine, better than fine, they were basically invincible. The man we'd been warned about all our lives had shown up and grabbed them, and here they were to tell the tale. Did you scream, we asked? We didn't hear you scream. You can't scream, Montana said. He's got a hand over your mouth. If anyone thought to question the logistics of this, a man grabbing you and holding you aloft while skating and keeping a hand over your mouth, no one did so out loud. How come no one stopped him, one of the Ellas asked. Montana rolled her eyes, because no one cares. The rest of us could see that this was true. The roller rink was a study in neglect and twitching neon. The skate floor was uneven, the carpet soaked in orange drink, the whole place smelled of sweaty socks and popcorn, even though pop no popcorn was sold. Teenagers commandeered the rink by five o'clock onward, so all our birthday parties had to be scheduled for early afternoon, leaving a long stretch of evening to feel irritable from too much sugar and a vague crawling dissatisfaction we didn't know how to name. Disappointment? Jealousy? Whatever the feeling is when the fun thing is over and done and you want it to have been more fun than it was, and you have to confirm to everyone, the party giver, your mom, your brother to make him feel like he missed out, how outrageously much fun it was. And you're beginning to guess that this could be true all your life. And fun is just another thing that in the end, isn't all that fun, that feeling. Which guy was it again? We asked with some desperation. Lacey and Montana turned and gestured unhelpfully, that one. 
Three more girls fell victim to the lifter that afternoon, at which point some of us were so scared we'd nearly wet our pants and could not eat our soft cups of white ice cream with small paddles. When our mothers finally arrived, we ran to the cars. How was it, they asked over the baby screams. Fine, we said, or okay, or he's in my seat. It wasn't till much later, bedtime for some of us or weeks or months for others, that we told our moms the whole story. That's ridiculous, they said, Montana was lying. She was not, we shouted or whispered or tearfully gasped. I saw him. You saw this guy pick up Montana? Well, no, we had not seen that, but Montana likes to play games, you know that. She was messing with you. Lacey said it too. Oh, well, Lacey, they said, and that was the end of that. <laughs> Did we believe our mothers? Some of us, sometimes. This we already knew. Two things could coexist, even if they seemed like they would cancel each other out, like positive and negative numbers in math. Our fathers, for example, could love us, but hardly ever visit and often forget our birthdays. We could be incredibly lucky to have gotten a scholarship to such a good school and be receiving such a quality education and still frequently feel dazed with boredom and unable to name a single foreign capital. Montana could be lying about the lifter and there could be menace everywhere, circling the rink, looking like anyone. So in February of seventh grade, we were stunned maybe, but not disbelieving when Montana reached us before school in the atrium one morning and asked breathlessly, is she here yet? We looked at each other, who? Miss Falconer, she said, as though this should have been obvious. Have you seen her? We shook our heads. What about Miss Falconer? Why do you want to know? Montana leaned against the brick pillar and closed her eyes, giving us all a moment to admire her sparkly silver eyeshadow. Can you keep a secret? She asked when she opened them. We all nodded. Secrets? About all we did at 12 was have secrets, ours and everyone else's. Anything worth knowing was worth calling a secret. We ate secrets for breakfast. I think I'm in love with Miss Falconer. We stood there in silence for a moment. Why? One of the Ellas finally asked. She's so beautiful, Montana murmured, and she's not that much older than us. And she just has this extra, I don't know, like you want to listen to her from inside her head, you know? We sort of knew. Miss Falconer was new to the Midwest and to our school. We had all signed up for psychology with her, eager to have someone so young and artistically dressed explain us to ourselves. What about guys, though, Lacey asked. Don't you like guys? Montana rolled her eyes the way she'd been doing since she was eight years old. I am so over guys. Ms. Falconer chose that moment to emerge through the front door and head down the walkway. Good morning, Ms. Falconer, Montana called out as she passed, as a wake might crest after a shift. The teacher turned and her smile brightened by degrees. Good morning, Montana, she said. Don't you look nice this morning? Montana stayed where she was long after Ms. Falconer vanished into the crowd, staring. Her back was very straight, her face very still. We instantly felt more awake and alert. This was a look we loved and dreaded in equal measure. Montana had a plan. Thank you. Elizabeth, you need to unmute. You do, so I'm a little confused. All right, here we go. Um, I was thanking Anya, and now we will hear from Whitney Waters, who will read a selection of poetry, including the one that appears in this issue. Thanks, Elizabeth. Um, I'll be reading three poems, the first of which uh, appears in the Great Smokies Review this issue, and it's called Behind the Counter. I stood as if on stage, making drinks and taking orders, surrounded by the juicer juicing, the blender blending, the high whistle and gurgle of milk frothing in a pitcher. A conductor, I'd set them all into motion, scooped the frozen fruit, ground the espresso and tamped it down fed each carrot stick into the juice chute and watched pulp fly like sawdust from a wood chipper as bright orange juice tumbled out of the spout. I emptied all the pulp and grounds into a compost bin, hauled it out at night. We kept it latched, the key on a kitchen spoon because the manager said we didn't want anyone to get the food inside. When I opened it, rotting banana peels and moldy orange rinds stewed with summer heat floated up I couldn't imagine anyone, not even the feral cats in the parking lot, wanting it. Inside, women with full shopping carts scolded me for juicing their celery stalks with leaves still attached. It tastes so bitter that way. Preached about juice cleanses and cure-alls. At the end of the night, I cleaned out the pastry case, threw muffins, croissants, bagels into a black trash bag, all that dough and crystallized sugar, piled together like discarded Christmas toys vacuumed crumbs from beneath trays, 
shines the glass doors so all the smudged handprints of the day that ghostly residue of touch couldn't be seen the next morning. Um, this next poem is in 10 sections. All around me, the world is in bloom. One, all week a goose has been nesting on the riverbank. I watch her body stretch wide over leaves, tufts of white down scattered around her like petals. She stands, reveals her perfect white eggs. Two, one morning I woke up to five missed calls and a feeling like sinking through silt on a riverbank. Half of me disappears. Three, when I drove down to Georgia, it rained four inches in a day. The creek beds and riverbanks full and brown brushed by, spilled over. Four, in the funeral home parking lot, Green leaves decorated spindly branches like garish ornaments. It was too warm for March. My bare legs weren't ready. Five. One morning I woke up and my mother did not. Six. My father's wailing woke me in the middle of the night, a deep animal cry. I lay in bed, still a stone. Seven. Her garden statues toppled like a ruined city how perilous spring can be. Eight, tulip stems sprout from bulbs she mailed last winter. Mornings, they open their pink and yellow mouths like hungry birds. Nine, one morning, I woke up. 10, when I go to the bridge, I find only an empty nest. White feathers sun-dried like dandelion seeds blowing into the river. Um, and this is the last poem called Voicemail Box is Full. Last night, my dead mother called me, but I don't remember what she said. I was too busy scrubbing paint off the white walls, too busy dreaming other dreams to listen to the dead. If I had known to call her the night before or the night before that, what would she have said? Would I remember our last conversation? I have her voicemail saved, her voice stored on a cloud, a modern miracle. Clips of happy birthday, of call me back when you can, of I haven't heard from you in a while. The living forget to say what it is we mean. What I mean to say is a bee hovered so close above my forearm that I felt all the tiny hairs blown over like grass beneath a helicopter. What I mean to say is sometimes I watch the phone flash my father's name and don't answer, that I still say good night, see you in the morning, as if I'm certain I will. Thank you. Thank you, Whitney. Um, finally, we are going to hear from Janet Moore, our special features editor, filling in for Rachel Stein, whose story Sheep was chosen for our reading Redux. Redux, not sure how to say that feature. Janet? Thank you, Elizabeth. I appreciate that introduction. Um, let me just give you a little bit of an introduction into Rachel's piece. Um, I have read more than my share of books about writing and how to be a better writer, but none resonated with me the way George Saunders did. Maybe it's my age uh, or my frame of mind or his self-deprecating humor but a swim in a pond in the rain in which four Russian writers teach a master class in writing, reading, and life changed the way I approach writing and more importantly, revising. That's where the magic really happens. And that's what inspired us to create a new section for the Great Smokies Review called Writing Redux. Rachel Stein provides us with an excellent example of what Saunders is talking about, about that magic that happens when we revise in her revised version of Sheep. It's my privilege in her absence to share a few pages of this very fine work with you. Tim waited for me at the bottom of the hill where a shoulder high stone wall broke the trail. He knew I'd be timid about crossing. If you didn't climb these centuries old walls delicately, the stones might topple. 
In many places, the walls were only rubble. No one seemed to have the art anymore of relaying them in the neat mortarless rows. Tim climbed and waited to straddle the top. He reached down and pulled me by the left hand while I inched my weight up. When I balanced up there too, ready to let go and jump down, he squeezed my fingers and brought them slowly to his lips. He looked at me over the clutch of knuckles, his head tilted down. He looked up from under pale brows with the blue steadfast appeal of a child. Please don't, Tim, I whispered. I shook my head, pulled my hand away and jumped. I walked fast and hard up the next hill where tall and black against the light stood a dolman two upright stones bridged by a horizontal slab. Soon my back was wet and my calves burned, my feet slid in my shoes. At the top, I tore off my pack and dumped it, then lay in the dolman's cold shadow. Blood drummed in my temples. I placed my palm flat against the surface of the standing stone. Even with that small touch, I could feel its size and heft its age, a human marker here in the wild. People had set this place aside, unnumbered, years ago, and these rocks themselves seemed human to me, something upright and distinct against this desolation of sheep. My lungs slowed. I wiped my steamy glasses and told myself that soon I'd begin a bright new phase, alone. I pictured myself a serious hermit, reading literary texts late into Atlanta nights. Funny how the name Atlanta sounded old. My imaginings of it glared with glass and metal. Tim didn't like cities and heat anyway, but what would he do on his own? I couldn't picture him going in a straight line towards anywhere. He eddied so. One year he took up geology and spent weekends hiking to expose rock formations. Next, he spent all our savings on an old piano with broken strings that six of his friends lugged into our apartment like coffin bearers. Most recently in Swansea, he'd seen a, a set of Irish bagpipes in a pawn shop window and had stood there jabbering about the marvels of Ilian drone harmonies until I pulled him away. That fit. He'd probably get a set of pipes and hide in some mountain cove driving the wildlife crazy while he learned to squeeze the bag so it didn't bleat like a dying animal. I heard the thud of Tim's pack when the crunch, then the crunch of Heather in my ear as he lay beside me. He smelled like a child, clean cotton and old sour socks. Sorry, he said. Oh, I know, me too, truly. He rolled on his side to watch me, he stretched one curl of my hair out to its full length, then let it spring back. But couldn't we just try? No, we've tried already. I think we've done our best with each other. I sat up, ran my fingers through his, my hair to neaten it. I started rummaging in my pack, my head down. He sat too. I know, I can't help it, he said. I can't just stop just because you tell me to. Oh, Tim, I know, I, I do know. I handed him a slice of Welsh fruit bed, bread. Here, eat, I said. I gave him an open look, let the sadness show in my eyes. I'm sorry, I don't know what to do to make this any easier. He held the bread in his hand, eyes on my face. I touched his hand, shook it gently. Tim, eat, please. I bit into my slice. It was moist and spicy, but my mouth was dry. I chewed a long time before I could swallow. Tim broke off a small piece and placed it in his mouth. Then he began absently tearing the bread, rolling little balls and dropping them on the ground. They looked like the pebbles of sheep dung sprinkled about. He brushed his hands on his jeans and pulled his penny whistle out of his pack. We'd bought a pair of whistles in May and learned together how to move our fingers over the note holes. Even then I'd been biting my words back, but Tim had no idea. 
He blew a slip jig, his fingers jumping along the tube. The windy tune carried thin and bright over the stones and the open land. The sheep below stopped and raised their heads. They turned them from side to side, but since we weren't moving, they weren't frightened. I looked back at Tim. I studied his face above the jumping fingers. His eyes squinted against the sun, the brows and cheekbones drawn together. And without that round blue gaze, his face was harsh, mask-like. The skin here unfreckled, a boiled pink. I could have bitten his nose, fleshy and pocked as a strawberry. He noticed me watching and stilled his fingers. The last note hung. He took the whistle from his lips and waved it. You too, he demanded. I shook my head. I can't, you know I can't keep up. Yes, you can. We'll do something slow. He replaced the whistle between his lips, took a breath and began to blow a sweet air. The sad melody dipped and rose, rested for a moment on a mournful note like a question, then rose again. Humoring him, I hunted for my whistle, placed the, mountain, the mouthpiece on my lips and began to play a simple harmony. The notes seemed to rest against each other, thickening. I had once loved sharing music with Tim, but now our chords grated on me. I stopped my breath, cutting off this last resonance between us. I longed to be uncoupled, free to move in my own direction without Tim's sorry reluctance dragging behind. I ached to be my separate, single, solitary self. Thank you. Thanks, Janet, very much. Thanks to all of you for being here and reading and sharing your wonderful writing with us. Now, I think Lily has a word for us. Yeah, I just want to thank everyone again for reading for us today. Um, thank you to our audience for joining us. If you want to join us for our next reading in January, please keep an eye on the Great Smokies website for details about our Spring Writers at Home series. And until then, again, a huge thank you to Malaprops for hosting. Don't forget to register for a spring class if you're interested. Again, our website is greatsmokies.unca.edu. And I hope you all have a safe and joyous Thanksgiving and holiday season. <laughs>